This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today I have Chris Masters joining us, former WWE star. I believe he was also in TNA for a little bit, and now he is heading to the National Wrestling Alliance slash United Wrestling Network for his debut this Tuesday night. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, I'm all right, Hannibal. Thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, I kind of went into it a little bit with you uh, before the show. Uh, I had a show this weekend that unfortunately got canceled and uh, the Los Angeles Lakers lost uh, last night. So it's been a uh, tough go at it over the last day. But uh, overall, I'm all right. At least it looks like it's a nice day out there. It's already getting cold here in Canada. So be happy that you're in California there in the sun. Oh, well, I, I think I told you I spent a good three years in Toronto up and I moved back to L.A. about a year ago. So believe me, I know what you mean, man. Like and I, I just I wasn't used to the season. So it was especially hard for me being up there and, you know, just having the shovel snow and all that stuff. I was just man, I was just dying to wear shorts and flip flops again is what it came down to. Your traps are looking as big as ever. What have you been doing for your traps lately? Oh man, uh, just shrugs, man. You know, if you if you're serious, man, I just shrugs, different variations of shrugs, dumbbell shrugs and machine shrugs. But I mean, I think you know how it is. There's some body parts that um, genetically, kind of, uh, you just have. And like, even before I started working out, I kind of had some traps on me. You know, I was really skinny, but it was like the first muscle I kind of developed. So I think it's more kind of a genetic thing for me. But uh, you know. Upright rows and shrugs, man. That's it. It seems like calves and traps are like the two body parts that someone either has or they does they don't in bodybuilding. Oh yeah, and I and it's funny you say that because while I have decent traps, I have my calves are terrible, you know. And I, you know, I could train them harder. I guess I try to put the effort in, but it just feels like, you know, I got small joints down there and. Um, they're just they're hard to build for me if not like impossible like i've tried at various points to really emphasize them and, and it just doesn't happen man it doesn't happen for me so for the fans watching this the link to that nwa pay-per-view is in the description it's also at the hannibal tv.com if you guys want to buy this pay-per-view on tuesday night how did you get involved with this united wrestling network who are you wrestling, and is this going to be a recurring thing, you appearing on these Tuesday night pay-per-views? Well, um, the, how I was reached out to was through a guy I think you know fairly well now, uh, being uh, Rick Bassman and then uh, obviously Dave Marquez. I, I'm from Los Angeles, so those guys were obviously uh, been prominent figures in professional wrestling since uh, since I broke into it pretty much. Rick Bassman broke me into wrestling essentially with Ultimate Pro Wrestling. And then, um, uh, you know, Dave Marquez, he's just been doing his thing here forever, man. So, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, was a perfect fit type thing. And so they reached out to me. And as far as uh, who I'm wrestling, I'm wrestling uh, Block the Hate, Fred Rogier. And as far as multiple appearances, I mean, uh, why not? I mean, I, I kind of felt like this was a good opportunity because it gives me, I haven't been on any real like national or international platforms in a while. Like I had, like you were alluded to the cup of coffee and impact wrestling, which was cool, but um, you know, it's been a while. And uh, you know, so I still, you know, for me, it's a nice chance to be on a platform and show people that, uh, you know, haven't been able to see me in a while that I can still go. And uh, you know, hopefully for many appearances, I mean, it, may, it makes it convenient because I'm local here in Los Angeles. So I don't think it's too far from here. So Definitely something I, I'm sure that we can revisit um, a few times. I think Marquez agreed to do, I think he's got some kind of deal where he's doing like 50 or over 50 shows. So uh, I'm sure I'll fit in there somehow. Yeah, from what I understand, they've agreed to do this for a year. Or so I'd love to see you in there more. They definitely need more star power and, and more guys that look like wrestlers, uh, which you definitely still have the look. Uh, Michael Allen has a question on here. I never heard about this, but was there an accident where Stevie Richards got his face busted in a match with you or something? 
Yeah, that was my debut match on Raw. I gave, I used, at the time I was using a Polish hammer. And, uh, you know, there's a huge backstory to this. You know, I, I got really sick on my debut of uh, night on Raw, like from something I ate the night prior. And I had the worst food poisoning you could imagine. Like I couldn't hold down a drop of liquids and I was just throwing up and other things pretty much all day. So then fast forward to the match, you know, I just wasn't feeling great obviously going into the match and then i just made a mistake and um you know he was firing up on me and then he went to hit the ropes and you know i was selling his blows but then i turned to give him a polish hammer kind of blind but you know you kind of never imagine that you're going to miscue it to that extent and you know it's supposed to come across the chest upper chest area but instead it came right across his face man broke his nose broke his uh his bo eye bone here orbital bone and uh it was traumatizing, man. I felt terrible, and he was upset. Yeah, it was not a uh, not a smooth start, to say the least. Well, accidents happen. Uh, wrestling with Wrestling wants to know the story about you saving your mother from a home intruder. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, I'll give you the kind of the condensed story of that because it's a long, detailed thing that I've had to tell many times. You know, like I even came up with different versions of it, like uh, – long medium form and whatnot but essentially what it was is uh one of her neighbors who i think was tripping on um like meth or something like that locked himself into her apartment with her in it and then you know he was just tripping so and he started like barricading the door and i had gotten word that something was going on over there and my mom didn't pick up the phone so i got there and i realized i was locked out and i heard him through the door and he was just talking madness he wasn't making any sense so you know, I got worried, but I kind of figured I might not be able to get in the house. Like I thought about kicking the door open, but, uh, you know, I was looking at the situation and, you know, I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, you're a big pro wrestler. But, you know, I just didn't think I was going to be able to get the door down. It's a really strong door and not to mention it was barricaded, which I don't even think I knew. But uh, eventually, fast forward, the police got there and he was not opening the door for them. And then an officer started trying to kick the door down, like I had mentioned, and he had big boots on and everything, and he couldn't get the door down. So then they got the battering ram, a couple strikes with the battering ram, and they finally get it open. And then we realize it was barricaded, right, because it broke on the hinges. But now what happens is the, he starts a fire in there, and the fire starts catching real quick, and smoke comes burrowing out the door. So all the officers start backing up because they can't proceed. You know, it's just uh, it's too much. And but I'm irrational because it's my mom. So I'm kind of like, what the hell are they doing in my head? So then I'm like, screw it. You know, they put me to perimeter and then I <clears throat> kind of get into action. I turn on the hose and they break the window where the fire is. And I put the hose through the window. I don't even know what I was thinking. You know, I was just thinking that maybe it was still small enough where that would help. And then I come around to the other side and uh, I remember she's in her bedroom, which is right next to the front door where they had the smoke was coming out. And so uh, what I did is I told them she was in that room. She's in that room. But the only problem is there was a big tree blocking her windows. So basically the way they tell the story is, uh, or at least they did, was that I uprooted the tree. But in reality, what I did is I grabbed, like, kind of like waist locked the tree and like tackled it down to the ground, which cleared the windows. Uh, there were two windows. They broke the first one, no sign of her. Then they break the second one and then boom, she pops up and uh, I'm, super like you know what i mean i just get right up i pull her out of the window and i carry her to safety and then you know they eventually end up apprehending uh him so that that's the shortest way i could possibly tell that story by the way so that was about the gist of it wow that's a crazy story i'm glad it turned out all right yeah you, you mentioned you trained at upw with rick bassman a lot of famous wrestlers came from there. It was a development territory at one point in time. Who were some of the guys you were training with during your time there? Well, so when I first started with UPW, I was 16 years old. And uh, I actually started right at probably the same day, coincidentally, as John Cena. And I so I started my training there. I probably trained for a good two, maybe three, at the most four months. And uh, it was with, I think Cena is the only, the most notable one, because I don't know how much you know about some of the other guys. There was a guy named Bad Boy Basil um, there too. He actually got signed with Cena, but then he tragically ended up 
over overdosing before he actually made it to WWE. So that was unfortunate. But uh, yeah, and for me, so yeah, we kind of started right around the same time together. But what happened with me is, is I was uh, trying to um, execute a leapfrog over a guy named Andrew Bernardsky, who like some of your viewers might know, he was on the program, he played uh, Leatherface. I mean, he's been on various stuff, really big dude and, uh, you know, impressive guy. But basically, uh, I didn't clear a leapfrog. Um, and so I kind of took one of those rough landing ones, you know, like when, when you kind of bump somebody on the leapfrog and I came down on my ankle like real bad. And, uh, you know, I thought it was just hurt, not injured. So I continued to go to wrestling practice for a few weeks, but man, it was not getting better. And then eventually I went to uh, see a doctor and found out it was fractured and uh, had to have surgery, had to have it scoped. And then I just kind of realized that, uh, you know, after seeing guys like Basil and Cena, I realized, you know, like, okay, I could train at 16, but like, I'm way too young. I got a lot more work to do on myself and, and maturing to do. So, you know, and I saw also the way they looked, you know, and like I was starting to, you know, build myself up, but I'd only been working out for like a year or two. So I kind of just, after I got hurt, I just decided, okay, I'm going to put that aside for a year, maybe two years. And I'm going to focus on like getting in the best shape possible and taking uh, bodybuilding on as a hobby. And so I just focus on that. And then, uh, you know, I eventually returned when I was 19 uh, to training or maybe even 18, actually 18 and a half. So I had a good two year layoff from that point. Eric Tupelo tips you four ninety nine and says, "What do you do now differently than in years past to prevent sports injuries?" Uh, well, you know, it's helped that I've had a girlfriend who's a uh, she's a, a physical therapist for the last few years, Canadian girl too, and uh, but and she's made me real aware of different things uh, that you have to do in order to prepare yourself. Like we all know to stretch, you know, stretching is always important, but you know, like even when I'm working out, just making sure that I thoroughly warm up my, my rotator cuffs, being aware of my feet and my ankles and uh, making sure that I'm uh, putting work into the mobility of my ankles. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy to overlook certain aspects of your body you know you just go in go into the gym and you train your big muscles or you stretch out a little bit and then you go wrestle but you know if you're really uh you know meticulous and and make sure that you kind of prepare everything you know head to toe as much as possible i mean that seems like the best recipe to kind of avoid injuries at least it's been working through the last few years for me there's been a few fan questions already about you training with Warrior and RVD, and people also <laughs> want to know if you're still friends with RVD. Uh, no, I was not there for RVD and the Ultimate Warriors training. Uh, it's funny that they had asked that. I, I did see some of the clips, and from what I understand, they didn't do much that day, really. You know, it was more just kind of ceremonial than anything. But, uh, yeah, RVD and me are still friends. We're not – I mean – I would say he was one of my kind of few like friend friends, like in terms of like not just being a wrestling friend, but like uh, like he lived he used to live local to me, to, so I used to see him a lot more, and I considered him one like a friend friend rather than just a wrestling friend. But um, you know, he's in Vegas now. I mean, we just uh, you know separate lives. I mean, you know how it is as you get older. I mean, you uh, lose touch with people. Some people you talk to every once in a while, and you know, it just is what it is. But it's always nice when I see him, like whenever I see him, like the way we, you know, and this is how it kind of is with any of your true friends. And I think you'll probably agree with this, like with your true friends, even if you don't talk for a long time, kind of when you get up, when you do talk to them again, you pick up right where you left off type of thing. And, you know, there's a lot of nice catching up to do and stuff like that. So, yeah. And as far as the warrior, what was it like being around him? <laughs> yeah that was a trip man i mean nwe uh, in spain so um and uh, just to you know point this out too like just so everybody knows like ultimate warrior was my first favorite wrestler i mean he basically got me watching wrestling you know like if you're around our age group hannibal or for at least most wrestling fans you were either as a kid and going into your teenage years, you were either a Hogan guy or a warrior guy for the most part. But um, 
Uh, where he was a loud dude, you know what I mean? I didn't necessarily take to him when I was with him in Spain, but I think a lot of that was just brought on by all the negativity that I had heard about him from, you know, I had already had a WWE run at that point. And <clears throat> so, you know, all you hear going into like your first encounter with him is all these horror stories and what about what a horrible guy he was. And, you know, just n nothing really positive from anybody in the business. But um, I kind of regret it because I feel like I brought a lot of that in when I met him and I kind of like judged him or just automatically thought he was a dick. And I, rather than, you know, really, you know, forming my own opinion and maybe making the effort at least to like get to know him and talk to him a little bit. So, uh, you know, he, he seemed, you know, he just seemed like a very different personality than me. You know what I mean? He's the type of guy where he walks in the room, he's very warrior-esque, he's very loud, he's got, you know, he's got those conservative values, which uh, can be a little off-putting to me, you know what I mean? When you're, I don't know, I just, seems like oil and water type thing. But I, again, I wish I would have got into like, you know, maybe even hang out or work out with him, him a little more, especially after he passed, you know, it just felt like bad. It was like, oh, I, you know, I got to be around him, but I never really, you know, I should have told him, I should have just went to him and told him like, Hey, you were, you were my guy growing up. You inspired me to watch wrestling. You know what I mean? And, you know, just give him, give him their props. You know, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of guys who would probably say that same thing about guys they've looked up to in the business or guys that they've watched, uh, you know, like you kind of want to give those people their uh their just due. Crypto spasm tipped you fifty dollars. He says you're a legend, best physique of your era. Vince should have put the strap on you. Any truth that Pat Patterson wanted to use a strap on on you? I I'm only saying that because he tipped you fifty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know it was uh. Well, what was what was his question again? He was saying he just wanted. He basically just complimented you and said he feels you should have had a championship run. Yeah, you know, but uh, there was an article that came out recently, uh, and it was Bruce Pritchard, and he was uh, doing the something to wrestle, and they were addressing me because they were um, doing a show about Unforgiven 2005, and you know, it's just unfortunate because I had. Uh, my pers personal demons at that point that kind of got in the way. Like I was in line for, you could tell that Vince was going back and forth about possibly grooming me or putting me in a world title spot. But, you know, I think I might've done things to lose uh, faith in them. And then even, uh, even with the Intercontinental title was the same thing. They had me slated to win it. It was uh, in a four way, like tornado match or something on raw, but that's when they had caught in wind of, you know, I had a, uh, demons in terms of uh, prescription pill uh, difficulties. And so, you know, that kind of ruined that opportunity for me as well. And yeah, I mean, I had opportunity even with the tag belts. Carlito and me were actually supposed to win the tag belts at that WrestleMania 21. That was how it was originally slated, but the decision was switched just the day before, which is why, uh, you know, in wrestling, as again, you probably know, you know, you, you learn in wrestling to not count on anything you hear what's said until it actually happens. So that's kind of one of one big lesson from pro wrestling that you'll learn time and time again. Are you surprised that they're giving this Lars Sullivan guy another chance being that it came out, he's a gay porn star. And then he made comments about gays that were anti-gay comments before. And he seems to be injury prone as well, but he looks like he's getting another shot. It's funny you say that because uh, you know, I feel like I would have had no idea that he was getting another shot, but I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw a video uh, or a clip of him making an entrance. And then I think I started realizing, like at first I thought it was old, but then I think I saw virtual fans in the background. And then like it started dawning on me that, oh yeah, oh my gosh, they just gave this guy another shot. Like this has to be new. And then I think back yeah, because I had heard about the story. I remember I was in Wisconsin uh, or Iowa, and I was in the car with Jerry Lawler and Terry Runnels for an indie show, and that we had this big conversation about this this guy. And uh, yeah, and it was just shocking, man. I wouldn't have known outside of the fact that I just had been scrolling Instagram and saw him making an entrance, and I just thought to myself, "What the fuck? <laughs> Am I not supposed to curse on here? Is that going to demonetize this?" No, no. Okay. 
I just don't know if anyone's going to be able to take him seriously again. But I, uh, I don't know either, man. That's really that's a really, that's a good question. It really is. Like I would have thought that no, he wouldn't have gotten another shot because that's some pretty damning stuff. It's not a good look, you know. And uh, you know, think about it, man. If any kids Google this guy, I mean, what's going to come up, you know? So uh, although, but I don't, you know, it's great he's getting another opportunity, but I, it's just, yeah, it, it's perplexing. Now, I understand that at one point, uh, Bob Hawley, who's had heat with a lot of people, including Rene Dupree that we've talked with, I guess there was some incident with you and him, and he actually tried to get a match changed so he could oh, wrestle you and potentially rough you up in the ring. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so before I ever actually, like I was signed with WWE, but I was in OVW. And we had, it was the, when the TV tapings were close to Louisville, they would have us drive out to them. So, and Bob was already aware of me. He met me because he came down to OVW and he was there for another classic uh, mess up on my part where I didn't show up for a TV taping. Be and this was my first week in OVW, uh, mind you. I, I went straight from the airport to the arena. You know, I started going to practice pretty much from the day I got there, but you know, I was very green. I didn't know anything. And I looked at the TV sheet and I didn't see my name on there. So I just kind of figured, oh, you know, maybe I'm not needed and I'll take this opportunity to pick up some stuff I need for the house, do some shopping and get settled in. But, um, you know, obviously I got a huge promo cut on me by uh, Danny Davis and Jim Cornette, a guy, uh, you know, fairly well. <laughs> and, uh, and Bob Holly was there for that. So he didn't have a good taste in his mouth about me. You know, it was just a bad move. But, you know, I learned my lesson from it. But you fast forward. So we were at a TV taping visiting, you know, all of us and getting in the ring before the show, yada, yada, yada. And, you you know, like I'm sure everybody else does that, uh, you know, shaking hands is a big thing in, in wrestling. It's a sign of respect, especially when you're a green guy and you're coming into the locker room and you've got guys who've been there as long as Bob and jbl and all the veterans that were there in the time i mean like let's face it i mean i grew up watching a lot of these guys so the funny thing was is i was more intimidated than anything else i mean i was only 20 years old at the time and i'm thrust into you know not guys that are from my class but guy this is still all the guys that, again i grew up with and uh bob essentially just got mad because i didn't i walked into the locker room and he was having a conversation with three other guys and you know, I didn't shake his hand the first when I saw him that day because I, I saw him kind of or I barely did see him, but he was like crowded with three other guys and I didn't want to interrupt. So I just kind of went to my bag and, you know, Bob really took that as a sign of disrespect. Like I was like shunning him or I like I purposely didn't go to greet him and he was upset. And in his mind, too, it's like, oh, this is that same punk kid that didn't show up for the OVW TV taping. Now he's disrespecting me and who does he, you know, and a lot of guys were just kind of like, they couldn't understand like at 20 years old for the size I had and everything, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, it got me a lot of heat just coming in, you know what I mean? Cause uh, you know, I think a lot of people knew I was going to get a push and all that stuff. So, you know, I was kind of a heat magnet in terms of just that. And then some of my actions brought it on, you know, learning the business, learning the etiquette, of the business was still something I was learning in Louisville, which was a great place for that. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, going into a different generation of wrestling with, uh, you know, uh, Rip Rogers and Jim Cornette and those guys. I mean, they still find you if you were a baby face and a heel went out to eat outside of uh, training and stuff, you would get fined if you got caught. So, I mean, they still, you know, respected kind of protecting the business and, uh, yeah, but Bob was mad, and he was supposed to wrestle Carlito that night. And, yeah, he went out of his way to try to change the match so he could rough me up. And uh, But they didn't switch it. So <laughs> I could have taken it, though, honestly. Like, you know, I don't mind physicality. I mean, I would have been intimidated because of how young I was to the business. And, again, like even with Bob Holly, I probably was watching him since I was like 10 years old. So, I mean, the last thing I was trying to do was disrespect anybody, really. Lori tips you five dollars, and I already know the answer to this one. But was there any heat between you and Carlito at the time of your split as a tag team? I'm pretty sure you guys are close friends. Uh, there was never any serious heat between Carly and me. Like we've had our like a couple little instances where I've gotten annoyed with him, but and like 
you know, almost felt like I wanted to fight him. But like every time that's happened with him, he's just such a funny dude that it de-escalates very quickly. And then I realize I could never do anything to harm that guy. But uh, yeah, he's one of my closest buds. No, like we, uh, you know, we, I don't know if we were necessarily, you know, when we first started in WWE, it just kind of grew into that. You know what I mean? I think we were already traveling together. And then uh, once he came over to Raw from SmackDown, it was us along with somebody else. And then eventually they just kind of put us together. And from what I understand, it was, uh, you know, being with Carly was good for me because it was somebody to help season me. You know, him being a second generation wrestler and, you know, I needed to, it was good for me to have a guy around like that who was just so comfortable and knew the business so well and was, uh, you know, that we, there was some great stuff between us. You know, whenever we were, look back on it, we kind of wish they would have left us together a little while longer. Because if you remember, they were kind of in a rush to after WrestleMania to turn Carly babyface and they kept me as heel. And, you know, Carly still had a lot of good heel run in him at that point. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. Can't change the past. What happened with that plane match between CM Punk and Carlito? Did Carlito get the best of Punk in that one? Oh, man. I think uh, you're talking about on one of the Tribute to the Troop show. I remember – all I remember about that fight was, uh, you know, everybody got hammered on those. Like, those were the, some of the wildest stuff that I encountered in the wrestling business was the trip. Uh, over to the Middle East for the tribute to the troop shows because it was the only time I've seen Vince like really let his hair down and get like buck wild man like seriously like drinking and instigating fights a lot of that was on Vince I think Vince was trying <clears throat> you never know with Vince right like Vince was trying to peer pressure CM Punk into having a drink and I wouldn't really know what to do either if I see him punk because, you know, part of me, you know, you know, maybe Vince is testing him to see if he can get CM Punk to break his will. And then that'll make Vince lose respect for him or, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But and then eventually so CM Punk wouldn't drink. And then eventually it turned into uh, it went from CM Punk drinking to now, hey, uh, if you're such a shooter, CM Punk, how about you take on I think it was first Shelton Benjamin. And then after that, it was uh, Carly because Carly would kind of not shoot, flirt, but kind of mess with Maria and flirt with her. And I'm pretty sure CM Punk and Maria were together again at the at the time or were, were together at that point. So I think kind of the boys really kind of instigated that because we knew that um, CM was kind of annoyed with Carlito, uh, you know, trying to mess with him and trying to, uh, I guess, kind of, you know, again, work uh flirt with maria not shoot flirt with her so um but i don't even remember what happened i mean i think shelton carly you know nothing happened with carly and cm but i think shelton and cm actually um grappled a little bit but i mean you know that's no competition for shelton and that's i mean shelton's top level wrestler in the world as everybody knows so but it was wild yeah we were i was just curious if there was a fight that cm punk ever won uh, maybe <laughs> Carlito would have had the size disadvantage there, but I know those Puerto Ricans are pretty feisty, so you never know. Uh, there's a few fans on here that want to know if JBL ever tried to bully you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. And coincidentally, we're talking about the tribute to the troop shows. So I was – my first year going there, we went to Afghanistan, and they put us into different groups, you know, like the – Whoever they decide is going on the group goes, and then the whole group is separated into like three or four different groups. So in my group, I had Mick Foley, Trish Stratus, Carlito, JBL, and there might be somebody, oh, like Fit Finley was with us. And uh, man, JBL just tortured me the whole trip. I mean, he really, you know, just bullied me and trash talked me and like really just had, was all up in my head. and. Um, yeah, it was difficult. It was difficult because, again, at this point, I, I'm, pro I'm 20 years old at this point, and, you know, I'm getting angry with him, and I want to do something, but, like, I'm also, like, when is the right point to do something? You know what I mean? This is a veteran. He's been with the company, I think, at that point for, like, a decade, and, like, when is it a point where I need to, like, do something and, you know, would that be frowned upon or would that be respected and, you know, and when is that point? 
And, you know, I never obviously did anything. He just, it, it really, what it comes down to with a lot of those guys that you're talking about, like you talked about Bob and JBO and, you know, if you were a young guy coming up in that time, they would mind fuck you and they would work the deep mind fuck and they would try to get you second guessing yourself and uh, to lose your confidence. And, you know, a lot of it to them, I think was just, I don't know if it was necessarily even that they were trying to screw you over. It was just, you know, they, they felt it was their job to test you and make sure that, you know, you got the right goods or that you got thick enough skin. But, um, you know, who knows? Maybe, you know, maybe it was because they just wanted to fuck guys over. I, I don't know. I can't tell you that. You know what I mean? Boxing legend 2011 wants to know if it's true you and Randy Orton would bang a lot of chicks on the road. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, man. Like, Randy, uh, the whole time I was with him, he was married to uh, Samantha. And, like, you know, he's actually uh, one of those guys where he wasn't, you know, he wasn't out slutting himself around uh, as much as you'd think or anything like that. Like, when I've seen him and he's in a relationship and, you know, granted, we, you know, we have had our fun nights and stuff when we traveled. But, uh, you know, he just, he wasn't that type of guy. You know, he wasn't, you know, trying to look for a different woman every night or anything like that. He was pretty... That said on, uh, you know, he had his demons as did I, you know what I mean? Like we had our bad habits and whatnot, but it wasn't as much uh, trying to hook up with a different girl in every city. I mean, like when I first started traveling with him, he was in his relationship with Samantha. And then I was also in a relationship and actually engaged at that point. So, I mean, you know, we were trying to mind our manners. And as far as John Cena, did he kind of watch your back being a Rick Bassman guy? Or was there any competition between you two once you made it up to the uh, main roster? No, he did not watch out for uh, – we, we just never, like, really clicked for whatever reason. It was always odd. I don't know if it's, you know, him being – like, me being a West Coast guy and him being a kind of a Northeast uh, type dude. Uh, I don't know. It just, he didn't really look out for me. I don't think he was ever particularly fond of me. I don't know if he questioned my work ethic or what it was or, or, you know, if there was some kind of issue, but we just kind of uh, never got along. Like when I worked with him in WWE in my first run, it was very difficult for me to work with him. And it's hard to say that because he's like the top guy, especially at that point. But like when I would work with him, he had such little faith in me that he would want to call my offense for me. So I'd be getting heat on him and he would tell me what the next strike is. And like to me, man, like I had just come off working with Shawn Michaels and he had no issues with how I was working. So I couldn't understand like and and our matches turned out well. And, and Shawn even stuck up for me a few times because John Cena would try to, you know, bury me. And Shawn would be like, well, I had no problems working with him, which uh Felt real good for me because, you know, when I worked with Cena, it just, you know, there was always some kind of issue. And uh, and as you know, Hannibal, I mean, it'd be difficult for you to work as a heel and have somebody calling your offense to you. Like as a heel, you need to have it's the baby face's job just to react to what you do and sell. You know, it's not really it's not his job to call your offense because what's going to happen there is I might be committing to do something and you're throwing me off my rhythm type thing. So, uh, you know, yeah, it was we just. You know, never that close, really. That's it. Beater car tipped you five dollars, and he's wondering your honest opinion of Triple H and the McMahons. Uh they're different, man. You know, like I don't know, like I, they're, you know, with Vince, you can just tell that you know he, uh, you know, very. Uh, what's the right word for it? You know, like. He, you know, him and like Donald Trump remind me of each other. You know, these are guys who like, you know, they're all about power. You know, they, they live different lives than the rest of us. You know, they, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it can be cold sometimes. It can be, you know, it's very business, but, um, you know, they are, I mean, they are world wrestling entertainment at this point. And I don't see, you know, it looks to me like Vince will, continue to run WWE as long as he's probably breathing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think he's ever going to step away. But, um, I mean, it looks like Triple H and Stephanie will end up taking over WWE. And, you know, I can't tell you whose hands it would be better in, you know. So it is what it is, you know. But I, I had 
I, I loved working in WWE. It was like, it was a great experience, you know, like it had its ups and downs and, you know, it was, uh, you know, really cool to inevitably work with guys like Triple H and, uh, you know, some of those guys and Ric Flair and all that, you know, that was definitely a highlight. How was working with The Undertaker? I don't know if you ever wrestled him, but I'm sure you had backstage interactions with him. Yeah, you know, when Undertaker was around, which uh, for me early on wasn't too often because he was SmackDown and I was Raw. Every once in a while, we'd have a joint show, but it was funny just because I noticed anytime Undertaker was there, especially um, later on, you know, because when I came back to WWE, there was a whole new kind of crop of guys that even started after me, you know, like the there was a new generation of guys. And like Undertaker just commands so much respect that when he's at the arena, you know, it's almost like having the principal, you know, in town, like everybody sitting by the monitor with their hands folded and paying attention to the monitor and minding their P's and Q's and, you know, on their best behavior type thing. Cause it was just like, yeah, it was like, you know, he was definitively the locker room leader of locker room leaders. And um, in terms of working with him, the most I got to work with him was in overseas. Uh, there was a tour uh, where I got to work. Uh, I was very fortunate to work some tag matches where I teamed up with Fit Finley against Undertaker and Kane. And uh, it was a blast. I mean, you know, it's just, to me, I always remember what a trip it was watching him get into character and watching that moment before he walks like when he's transitioning from Mark Calloway into The Undertaker. And it all happens. He puts his stuff on. And then there's this walk that starts way before he even goes out of the curtain. Like the walk doesn't start right when he walks out of the curtain. It, start, it starts like a good 10 feet before he walks out of the curtain. So he takes that time. He slows everything down. And then, you know, by the time he gets to the curtain, I think he's already, already fully transitioned. And, uh, you know, there's a certain level of mystique to that, especially if you're uh, – you know, like lifelong wrestling fans, like I'm sure, you know, mostly everybody who's probably watching today is, or if you're, you know, old enough wrestling fan, that is. So uh, very cool, man. Very fun experience. And I mean, those guys are just the easiest to work, you know, because, you know, when you're working guys like Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker, it's like you already kind of know everything they do just from all the times you've watched them, you know, and you're just kind of having fun kind of being there for the ride for a lot of the stuff you've watched, you know, like Undertaker grabbing you and, you know, chugging you into the corner and that type of stuff. But, um, yeah, that's it. Just a couple more tip questions here. You already kind of answered this. Was Shawn Michaels good to you or a jerk? It sounds like he was pretty good to you. Yeah, well, I met, you know, I met, you know, Shawn Michaels to me seems like he was two different people, you know what I mean? Like, that is Shawn Michaels that um, I grew up like idolizing and stuff. I mean, you hear the horror stories and it just sounds like, wow, you know what I mean? Like this guy was very difficult and, you know, who knows what my relationship would have been with him at that point. But when he came back, you know, he was just to me and I didn't know him personally before, although I wish I would have kind of asked around the hunter and stuff, but he just seemed like a completely different guy, uh, you know, just in every aspect, you know, and he was, uh, I kind of established with him right from the get-go, like I kind of told you I wish I had would done with Warrior in terms of getting me to watch wrestling. I told Sean right from the get-go, like, hey, man, I grew up, like, idolizing you. You were it for me. You were the guy, and I just wanted to get that out of there so he knew that, uh, you know, where I was coming from the, with, with working with him and how it was like a dream come true. It was like getting, you know, if you were – you know, just your all-time hero, getting to work with them in the ring. I mean, you can imagine that's a really cool thing. And, you know, I just I just knew I just didn't want to do anything to uh, mess up that experience. And it ended up turning out okay. And, yeah, Sean was, Sean was good to me. Like, and I, I'm very happy about that experience because that would have been obviously uh, very disappointing to have somebody you thought so highly of, you know, and they're not cool to you. And Crypto Spasm tips you $10, and he wants to know if John Cena is as strong as the Big Show and other wrestlers say. You boy, yeah, that's one thing is legit about Cena. Like, Cena is a mutant. Like, he's one of those guys, man. Like, even if you look at him, like, on TV, you know, uh, I don't know if TV does him justice, but, like, when you're in person with him, he's got these wrists and these joints that are huge. Like, this guy's just – built differently and then like in terms of his lifting man i mean he's no joke i mean i'm sure 
you guys have seen some of the clips on Instagram and stuff like he's not it's not a work with Cena I mean this guy legit does work hard he's legit strong and uh I mean you have to be strong like when I see him lift up uh Big Show for the FU like that's incredible even if Big Show's getting light for him because I would imagine that I'm like man if I even with Big Show getting light for me for him to be perched up on my shoulders and me have to turn him I mean that's an incredible feat right there like that can't be uh you know discounted by any means so like yeah Le Cena is legit like legit 100% legit in terms of that another fan here tipped you five dollars says nice. what's your favorite TNA match oh man that, that's tough I, I don't know man like there wasn't that many great ones to speak of really like because the run wasn't that long and most of the time I mean I was kind of uh you know I was Eli Drake's dude so I was out there cheerleading for him for the most part so I think some of the most fun was actually um some of those the most fun I think I had was uh, this skit we did. It wasn't a match, but it was a thing where we were building to the pay-per-view, I think. And again, your best friend, uh, Hannibal, Jim Cornette, had suggested that I break a board over John Morrison's head. And this was a stiff board, man. And I was a little nervous. John's a good buddy of mine. And I was a little worried about, um, you know, breaking that on his head and making sure that it had enough give because it would really have uh, messed him up legit. But uh you know, and it, the whole idea was for me to break the board over his head and me and Eli just beat the crap out of him go, and go off air with that. And that was leading into one of the pay-per-views. And I don't know, I just remember that whole day and that specific segment being a lot of fun because the board broke perfectly on John's head and it just looked, it was amazing. I mean, you know, it was just, it was funny that I questioned, uh, <laughs> I questioned the whole thing and then when executed, it just, it broke. There was, uh, you know, like wood wood broke everywhere and it was just a really uh violent and uh fulfilling way to close the show and last question here another tip for you from eric what's and, next after wrestling career wise i don't think your career is over you're wrestling tuesday night on the nwa pay-per-view you guys can order it the link's in the description or at the hannibaltv.com but i'll let you answer the question uh Good question. Um, yeah, I'm going to wrestle as long as I can. I mean, I, I, I love it. I still love doing it. I still love traveling. And, um, you know, it's been unfortunate with the pandemic. You know, there just hasn't been much wrestling this year. But, of course, we got next week, uh, United Wrestling Network. So, um, But in terms of me, I mean, I've just been trying to work on myself. See, I broke into wrestling again so young that I, I, like, you know, I started working a job, I started working out, so I never even finished high school. So, I mean, I'm working on my GED right now uh, just to get my education. Might as well, it's never too late, you know, for anybody else who hasn't done it, you know, let me maybe motivate you. And I'm then enjoying it too, by the way. And I'm just kind of looking, you know, I do a Lakers Nation podcast for the LA Lakers, and Lakers Nation is a huge platform for the Los Angeles Lakers team. So, for me, I'm just kind of looking at maybe if I can do something kind of almost in your world here in uh, broadcasting, podcasting, um, whether it be sports, politics, anything like that. I just, I love all this, these different forms of content we have nowadays. Like I've told you before, I love your network. I've been listening and watching your stuff for a while. I love what you do. You did kind of like uh, some of the stuff you've done with Bruiser Brody has been amazing. Uh, great content. I love like, and like Howard Stern, you know, stuff like that. There's so much good stuff nowadays. So I'm kind of looking at something like that. And, you know, I did move back to Los Angeles. So, you know, if Hollywood ever opens back up, I'd love to go on auditions for, you know, commercial work, stunt work, whatever, anything, you know, I'm open to anything like that. So, uh, you know, just trying to see what else is out there for me, you know, cause I am 37 now and, you know, wrestling is here but you know i don't know how much longer i have doing it you know uh, i gotta start being realistic and seeing if there's other ways that i can uh, make a living for myself so in what addition people, to uh, in addition to at least where can people follow you on social media if they want to look you up and, and subscribe to your podcast and stuff uh on twitter i'm at chris adonis uh don't ask i just i have kept that from impact wrestling because they verified me so uh, I, maybe it's time to change it if I can. 
And then on Instagram, it's Chris Masters 310. And then again, I do the post game show for Lakers Nation official. So if you want to check that out, if you're a basketball person, I know there's a little crossover between basketball and wrestling, maybe. Oh, definitely. And and to close this off, is there anything you want to say about this United Wrestling Network pay per view Tuesday night? I think it's only seven ninety nine. People want to buy it. Uh, I have the link right in the description. Uh yeah. I mean, United uh, Wrestling Network. I, I think it's uh, hey, it's just awesome to have as much, you know, variety in terms of wrestling, especially with what's happened this year. You know, like we've. You know, there is no wrestling outside of, uh, you know, the big company. So it's nice that Dave Marquez has been able to do this, give some uh, the wrestling fans something else to watch during the week that's maybe an alternative. And in terms of myself and Fred Rozier, I mean, you know what, I think uh, that that's going to be a good contest. You got two guys with, we got chips on our shoulders and we both have uh, something to prove. We want to go out there and show that we're still viable, viable and should be uh you know, prominent in the wrestling scene. And so I would expect a good night of wrestling action packed and uh, hopefully everybody can uh, check it out.